Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome everyone to lecture three of the third week of Arms to Materials. Today we're going to continue talking about uh, uh, interatomic uh, potentials and uh, uh, last class, last lecture, we talked about how to describe covalent interactions. Today we're going to talk about how to describe van der Waals and electrostatic interactions in molecular materials. So, uh, as we said in, uh, during uh, last lecture, the total energy of the system, if we use an interatomic potential, uh, the, the total potential energy is an expression uh, of uh, that's a function of the uh, atomic positions, R sub I. And for molecular materials, we broke this total energy, total potential energy, into covalent interactions that we discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, but there's also two other types of interactions that are called non-bond interactions. Uh, one is electrostatics that originates from the fact that some atoms are going to have partial charges uh, associated with them. And uh, the uh, other term is van der Waals. Okay. And uh, so today we're going to discuss the physical origin of these interactions and special precautions uh, that one needs to take when de dealing with them. So let's start with van der Waals. Uh, let's think about what happens if I bring two helium atoms together. Okay, uh, what we saw in uh, weeks one and two is that uh, these atoms have the one s shell completely occupied with electrons. So when I bring them together, they would not make a chemical bond. Okay, because I have four electrons and, and I would populate both the bonding and the anti-bonding orbital. Actually what happens is, as I, as I try to push them together, uh, Pauli, uh, the Pauli principle, the Pauli exclusion principle, forces the wave function to distort, the electrons to distort, so, they, so that they don't occupy the same states. And uh, that leads to an increase in energy. Okay, So at very short distances, as I push them together, uh, there's repulsion. And uh, this repulsion can be described uh, with an exponential function, as you see there. Okay, So exponential repulsion between these atoms at short distances. Now, we also know that in some cases of uh, noble atoms, uh, there is a weak attraction, okay? That's why they you know, become liquids at very low temperatures. And we're going to talk about the origin of that uh, weak interact with weak attractive interaction that's called London dispersion. Uh, the origin of this is called is what's uh, known as induced dipole induced dipole interactions. So these atoms have a positive core and a, an electronic cloud uh, around them, and in average, they're spherically symmetric, so they don't have a dipole, a permanent dipole. However, the charge, the, the electronic charge is oscillating all the time around the, uh, the nucleus, and so instantaneously I can have little dipoles. And what happens is, if I have two atoms, and both of them have these uh, oscillations, uh, the, you know, each one can induce a dipole in a correlated way with one another, and these very weak induced dipoles, induced dipoles talk to one another, interact electrostatically in a way that's similar to a permanent dipole, permanent dipole interaction, but not quite. Uh, it's a much weaker interaction, and it leads to a little bit of attraction, okay? So it's a time-dependent phenomena, uh, it, its its origin is the time dependent oscillation of the electronic charge around the, the nucleus, and uh, if uh, you do a little bit of math and, and uh, about what's going on, you're going to see that the uh, effective interaction between these two uh, atoms decays as one over square root of six. Okay, so inverse. Uh, power of six of the distance between these atoms. Okay, and uh, the uh, Ashcroft Merman uh, book on, on solid state physics has a nice uh, derivation of, of this relationship. So, uh, 
as again uh, to to sum up this induced dipole induced dipole interaction has one over r to the power six dependence uh, that that's an interaction that decays very quickly okay um, just uh, to compare a permanent dipole permanent dipole interaction goes uh, decreases with one over r to the power three okay so it's a weaker uh, De decrease in the interaction and of course a point charge and a point charge interaction is 1 over R so very very long distance so you can see how from point charge to point charge very long range interactions permanent dipole permanent dipole the interactions decay much faster with 1 over R to the power 3 and this induced dipole induced dipole that uh, dominates um, dominate uh, London dispersion even faster, okay, R to the power 6. So, so it's a short range and actually weak interaction. If we put these two terms together, the short uh, distance repulsion due to Pauli and uh, this London dispersion attraction, we have a potential that looks like what you see in the plot over here that has a minimum and uh, we talked about when we discussed covalent interactions that there are several functional forms that people typically use for these and, and uh, for uh, van der Waals interactions the same type of functional forms. Uh, Leonard Jones 612 it has a inverse power of 6 uh, attraction and an inverse power 12 repulsion. Uh, this type of interaction was used quite a bit uh, uh, in early uh, computer simulations because it's computationally very uh, uh, simple and fast uh, to code. Uh, a little bit better physics you have uh, exponential 6 where the attraction is an inverse power of 6 as the induced dipole induced dipole and the repulsion is exponential. This functional form has a little bit of better physics although from a practical standpoint they are very similar. And we also talked about the Morse potential where um, uh, both the attraction and the repulsion are done with exponentials. Just like in uh, bonds, uh, in chemical bonds, there are three parameters that you care about in these terms. Uh, you have a, a bond distance, a van der Waals bond distance, which of course is much longer than a real bond. You can see in this example it's about three angstroms. Uh, the well depth is uh, the potential well depth is how strong this interaction is and of course these van der Waals interactions are much weaker than uh, covalent interactions. And the third thing that uh, we care about is the curvature. Okay, And uh, that has to do with uh, vibrational frequencies. In Leonard Jones, uh, there's only two free parameters, so uh, these three quantities cannot be independently adjusted. Uh, so you, in Leonard Jones, you give an energy scale and a distance scale, and the curvature is automatically given. In exponential six or Rydberg, and in Morse, you have three parameters, so you can independently pick your uh, equilibrium distance, well depth, or a, a bonding depth and the curvature at the bottom. Okay, all right. So uh, those are van der Waals interactions. Uh, we know from our treatment of quantum mechanics, and you guys have done a homework assignment on this, that when I have a heteropolar bond, when I bring two different atoms together, I can have charge transfer between the two, and what I end up with is with a bond that's partially covalent and partially ionic, okay? So differences in electronegativities between atoms lead to partial uh, transfer of charge, and so the, consequently the atoms are partially charged, and that plays a, a significant role in the bonding of many polymers, uh, and also in ceramics, like what you see there, that's a perovskite, okay? So, um, so the the Coulomb the interaction we uh, we know how two point charges interact with one another from quantum mechanics, right? Where electrostatics uh, was the, the the interaction between electrons and between electrons and ions, and as you all know, the electrostatic interaction is 
uh, uh, describe as the charge of one particle times the charge of the other particle divided by the separation distance. I apologize, this should have been capital R. Okay, we're using capital R for ions, okay, and smaller r for electrons. Uh, so that's the functional form. Um, this value here is just a unit uh, conversion uh, parameter. And uh, there are different ways of obtaining these charges, okay? Uh, one could use formal charges, although that's not very accurate. Uh, one can compute the actual charge, partial charge, from electronic structure calculations. And there are other methods to compute charges based uh, that are called charge equilibration methods uh, that compute charges in terms of atomic positions and the electronegativity and hardness of the atoms. Okay, so in terms of atomic properties and the configuration, the, the, the structural configuration can obtain the atomic charges. We're going to discuss the uh, charge equilibration in week five of the course. Now, uh, one thing to worry about uh, when dealing with electrostatic interactions is the fact that the Coulomb energy uh, decreases with uh, space very, very weakly, okay, uh, with, with separation, not with space. So what you see here in the plot is the comparison of 1 over uh, inverse of r to the power 6 and inverse and 1 over r. You can see that 1 over r goes down very, very slowly. And that means that uh, we need to worry about long-range interactions, okay, interactions of atoms that are very, very far away from one another. And you can uh, imagine that that causes comp computationally is very intensive because there's lots of neighbors to uh, interact with. Uh, but, but there's a, a more fundamental problem when dealing with periodic boundary conditions and infinite system. So what happens is the following. If I have a periodic system with charges that's overall neutral, but I have partial charges, um, the sum, the infinite sum that results when I want to do the interactions of all the atoms with all, every single other atom, uh, if you look at that sum from a mathematical point of view, uh, the, Cou the Coulomb sum is conditionally convergent. Okay, and what that means is that uh, the result of this infinite sum, okay, of adding all of these interactions, is dependent on the order in which you put the uh, summons, okay, the, the the terms in the sum, uh, and that's hard to to uh, to wrap uh, your mind around. Um, uh, often, because obviously in finite sums, uh, the order of the summons doesn't really affect the sum. In these infinite sums, um, in this infinite series, that's not the case. Um, what happens is that um, physically, the uh, interaction is so long range that whenever I add more atoms, uh, to the system, that new layer of atoms has a stronger effect than all the previous atoms combined. Okay, so imagine I have an atom at the origin, okay, and I'm looking at its interaction with concentric spherical shells of atoms, okay, and I'm going to do that one step at a time. I'm going to grow my infinite system one concentric shell at a time. So. Whenever I add a new shell, the number of atoms in that thin shell is going to grow with r squared, okay? And that's the area of a surface of radius r. The interaction is going to decrease with 1 over r. So that means that the number of atoms, r squared, times the interaction, 1 over r, is going to grow as I move to bigger and bigger concentric shells. So the last shell uh, has a bigger effect than all previous shells, and then every new shell uh, contributes more to the total sum than all the previous ones. So the actual arrangement of the atoms, how I define these concentric shells, 
influence influences the uh, result of these sums. Okay, so over the years, people have developed special techniques to deal with these uh, infinite sums, and uh, you need to make a decision on the boundary condition that you're going to apply at infinity, and uh, a, a method that solves this problem. Uh, that's a classic solution. is called the Ewald method. Okay. Um, the trick uh, of the Ewald method is some part of the sum is done in real space, and part of the sum is done in reciprocal space. And uh, over the years, people developed other techniques to do these Ewald sums uh, in a computationally more uh, less intensive way. And those methods are called uh, particle mesh Ewald, particle 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 mesh Ewald. There's a variety of them. And all of them allow you to treat long-range interactions in, in an accurate way, uh, but also in a computationally manageable way. Uh, to read more about uh, this physics of these infinite sums, uh, these two papers are actually very interesting. Okay, So uh, it's very instructive to read them, to go over them, and understand what type of decision one needs to make when uh, dealing with long-range interactions like Coulomb. OK, uh, one, one more note. Uh, both Coulomb and uh, van der Waals um, are extremely large interactions if, uh, between bonded atoms. Okay? So let's say I have two atoms, and they're chemically bonded. Okay? So the bond distance may be one, one and a half angstroms or so. And if you look at uh, my plot here of a typical van der Waals energy, uh, a one angstrom is over here. So you can see that the van der Waals energy at that one angstrom separation is enormous. And of course, the force associated with it, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to distance, would be gigantic. So uh, what we do in these molecular simulations is we exclude atoms that are bonded from the non-bond interactions. Okay, so when we compute van der Waals and Coulomb interactions, we ignore atoms that are bonded. Those are called one-two pairs. Okay, if uh, if two atoms are chemically bonded, you don't compute Coulomb or van der Waals. You also uh, ignore one threes. So if atom I is bonded to J and J is bonded to K, the first, the first and the last don't interact. Um, so those are one threes. And typically, you also define uh, exclusions or don't compute the interactions between one fourth. Okay, atoms that are uh, separated by four chemical bonds. Um, sometimes some potentials simply scale. Uh, the van der Waals or, or Coulomb energies between one, four atoms. Others ignore them completely. So those are, co are called exclusions. And uh, molecular dynamics codes would allow you to pick how to deal with exclusions when you're dealing with uh, covalent, inter when you're dealing with molecular materials. So let's put this all together. Um, what we're going to do is write the Hamiltonian for a molecular system. I know if I have a Hamiltonian, I can take gradient with res gradients with respect to atomic positions, get forces, and with that solve a molecular dynamics uh, simulation. So the uh, total potential energy of the system will have bonding interactions that I'm describing at the top. I have uh, I sum over all the bonds in the system of a potential that depends on the separation distance between the bonds. Then I have a sum over all angles in the system and the potential energy that uh, depends on the angle between these three atoms, okay, I, J, K angle. Then a sum over all possible torsions of the system, which are four body terms. And uh, the function, uh, the torsional potential will depend on the dihedral angle. We said that there's uh, often other 
for body terms like improper torsions that are described, so depending on which that, that are necessary, depending on which potential you're using. And then there's often two types of non-bond interactions. There's Van der Waals interactions and Coulomb interactions. And these sums run over all pairs of atoms. That's why I'm writing the sum as I less than J. And uh, the asterisk in the sum represents exclusions. Okay, so that's my total uh, potential energy, okay, and this mimics what the electrons are doing in the system, okay. This would be, if I did an ab initio MD calculation, this would be the eigenvalue, okay. And uh, on top of that, I have the kinetic energy of the ions, okay, and it's p squared over 2m for every single atom in the system. So uh, that's all for lecture three. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about interatomic potentials for um, metals and uh, crystalline covalent systems. Thank you.